Hello, my name's Ivo Graham. I'm a stand-up comedian making great hay with the many privileges I've enjoyed in my life. And undeniably, the foremost amongst them has been my enduring old-school friendship, though I didn't actually know him at the time, with Jamie Lang <laughs> and whichever podcaster he's co-hosting with on any particular day. <laughs> Woohoo, Ivo! Oh, hey, Ivo, you're touring at the moment, aren't you? I am, thank you, Jamie. <laughs> yeah, how's um, it going? Nottingham could do with a shove. <laughs> Um, well, not, I, Notting is always tricky, though. Really? Yeah, that's why I found out when I was doing it. <laughs> Sorry, why? Well, as in, like, the transport routes are tricky. Anything right? for me, when I did a little tour, the, anything for me v north of Watford yeah, was yeah. quite tricky. And tr I love... I mean, and listen, Jamie, no one can say you haven't earned your stripes in the stand-up comedy world, it, obviously in the podcasting world, um, and even in the touring world, but it's not quite the same. I, I'm not looking at a man who's sweated over whether he can get a discounted mega train to Nottingham, um, which is an East Midlands train, but booked through the Megabus booking service. Um, you've, you've, you've not Nottinghamed properly. Was it really hard? It was really there? hard. It was Nottingham was hard. And then the other one was really hard was going to uh, Southport. Right. South, Southport was really hard. Did that, you think it would be a I lovely just, port in the south, especially <laughs> near Liverpool? <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> it, it, honestly, in Southport, they have uh, they have more funeral care homes than I have ever seen in my entire life. And I went to the cinema by myself to watch Venom. That was, <laughs> what? That was my... Yeah, I don't know why you laugh. I did. It sounds like a really weird And I had a large trip. popcorn. Only time I've ever done this, Ivo. <laughs> I had a large salt popcorn that yeah. I devoured... And then I left the cinema halfway through to go and get a large sweet one to counter the salt. Oh, yeah, yeah, I yeah. Like slap in the face to Southport and a slap in the face to Venom. <laughs> yeah. I, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think those are the sorts of sad meals. I mean, I had a Five Guys in Canterbury just last night. Did you? And that's, you're just sort of like, oh, what am I doing? I'm in a strange place with an hour to kill and I'm making bad choices. <laughs> Although there's so many chips in the bag. <laughs> they, if, if someone at Five Guys has ever said, let's make people really grateful to Five Guys by always having loads of chips <laughs> spilling out of the cup into the bag. <laughs> it's worked an absolute treat on me. I couldn't believe it. You know, you, you should have gone to Greg's. Actually, uh, yeah, no, I'm just downloading the app. Yeah. Um, <laughs> man, I, I, I don't think you can have the same advert too many times on one podcast, actually. I, I certainly wouldn't re record an alternative version. <laughs> My lord. <laughs> You haven't lived until you've heard Alex Mitten list the hot drinks available in Greg for the third time in an hour. Yeah, yeah. Uh, life, life has really turned out. No, the way I, 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 I speak with nothing but envy for every aspect of this whole slick operation. Oh. I don't have my own podcast. Um, love, to, love to guest uh, and know that t to host one would be a good creative and undeniable. Why haven't you done access. it? Because I, uh, I'm. Um, indecisive, uh, lazy, sometimes busy, although often not, racked by self-doubt, and also don't know how good I'd be at some of the masterful uh, business aspects of a podcast, like saying to your friend with a straight face, hey, Alex, and, uh, and, and food's always better when it's free, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you really have listened to it. Like. He actually has listened to it. I didn't realise It's because anyway. Ivo won't, won't, won't skip it. He'll just go, oh, just... No, 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 no. <laughs> I'll, I'll listen and I'll learn. That's always been my policy. <laughs> you, can't, you can't skip life. Um, the, but the, the irony that I'm not, I'm not putting food on the table for my own daughter because I'm not willing to talk about <laughs> how food itself is always well, better when it's free. Have you been down to Greg's? Because it's actually free if, you, if you're <laughs> short of... If you're on the app, <laughs> yeah. um, what's, what, what are the kid options like? I don't know. It wasn't on, it wasn't on the list. It wasn't on the list. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what, what, do you still enjoy touring though? Is it, or yeah, does it's it, great. Is and it really? Now it's nice to be because... Um, May I be the first person to say, after the last three years, it's nice to be back out doing, you know, I've actually find, started to find it a little bit. Like I've, I've got a bit in the show which is about doing a, a gig on Zoom. And um, one, of, um, I think the bit stands on its, on its own. You sort of get into it by being like, it's so nice to be gigs, gigging again but it's been a year and a half now. And like when you see, you can see bands and like in every concert, there's this, I'm sure very sincere, but thing about, oh, and is it just so great to be like back in a room with people? I think that like that gratitude is really, uh, that there's, there, there was a lot of indoors and and now this sort of like buzz of being back is clearly not worn off for a lot of people. What, what is the bit about the uh, bit on the Zoom? I was doing a Freshers Week comedy gig on Zoom and, um, not, not a wholesome experience for anyone. Not the freshest week they were hoping for at St. Andrews University. <laughs> Why were you doing a, You did a freshest well, week. So it's sta stand up. It was stand up via Zoom. Zoom, yes. It was, Amazing. it was 2020, Jamie. It was literally <laughs> private parts and the St. Andrews <laughs> University freshest week Zoom comedy night.
that was the sum total of my work for six months. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and they weren't very interested in my school magazines there either, I can tell you. <laughs> so um, what was that going on? Well, one, um, one of them was making a risotto in his kitchen on the other side of the room, <laughs> just like not even by the laptop, just not even looking at it. And so you're sort of like begging through the laptop to be like, can you <laughs> just let it simmer yeah, for yeah. a bit and come and sit down? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> It's not a meal you can rush, famously. <laughs> It was. A pe- pe- <laughs> he was making a resort. Yeah. Yeah. Not yeah. even looking. Your classic freshers' week meal, obviously. <laughs> that's quite. That's I came quite, to university to play. It's quite <laughs> high end for for university food. <laughs> Who is this guy making a risotto? I like to start the most debauched week of my life with a solid ninety minute meal for one. <laughs> How things have changed since we went to, to uni. <laughs> We've got a visibly desperate Graham on line one, but this stock's not going to pour itself in gently, bit by bit. <laughs> so it, oh my God, that must be horrific to do it on Zoom. It wasn't great. But then, um, I mean, you know, Zoom was like, it was, it was, I think it was better than nothing. I liked doing the, the Zoom gigs. Mm. I liked lots of aspects of being at home. I liked, you know, not having to, uh, you know, I... I it, you know, the, our, our experiences in, in Nottingham and Southport and Canterbury. Mm. None of that when you're on Zoom, obviously. You mm. can just make your sweet and salted popcorn and watch Venom at home. You barely have to, you, you know, pause it for 20 minutes to do your gig and then straight back in. But, do you, but is there a sense also, because I feel like this happens, because you've got, you, you're your dad. You're, you're a dad. I'm a dad. You're a dad. I'm a dad, Jimmy. You're, you're a freaking dad. Mm. Do you think, firstly, before I go into that, do you think you have the qualifications of being <laughs> a dad? <laughs> do you think you do? I feel like... I think I do actually. Yeah. I, 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 what I, makes a good dad? Oh, man, alive. I know. What this, this is this? quite heavy duty stuff for private parts. Actually, I don't know. I was, I was ready for sort of more expensive cameras and lighting. <laughs> I wasn't ready for a sort of Parkinson-esque approach. Because I always think with dads, though, this is the thing, or, or parents in general. You know, there's no. You suddenly just become one. There's no like easing into it. You, um, suddenly, you, you, your, your partner has a baby. Or you would you adopt a baby, or whatever happens, you, you suddenly have a baby, and then you're suddenly you need no license, you need no um, certificate, you need a license you to drive. You need no license. You need no <laughs> license. You just suddenly you're just suddenly a parent. Yeah, that's what I find wild about it. I, I do think obviously that certain aspects of it are very uh, intimidating, and you never you're never completely ready. But I think they do try to lay out a little bit of a runway for the new parents. You've got your nine months, obviously. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You've got your, your classes that you can go to at the hospital. You can read your books. You could even hang out with some uh, friends and their children. If you're, if you're an uncle or aunt, then maybe you've got a bit of practice already. I do think like, I, I had a fairly clear idea of what it would be. I think, I think the thing that's sort of, that you're not really able to imagine is how it will affect all the rest of your life. Mm. But I think the, you know, the experience of looking after a child and... You know, having to do it all night and like that. So I don't. I didn't find that hugely surprising. And also now, I mean, obviously, you'll just be doing a podcast about having a baby. Yes, yeah. that's, that's, yeah. that's that's surely Every, next. everything's yes. a commodity. Everything, <laughs> every aspect of your life is yeah. a dollar sign. <laughs> Grimacing her way through the second trimester podcast with Jamie as he insists that it's still time she, to curl out another she, TikTok. She's now breaching. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> These TikToks aren't good for my pelvic floor. The content must never cease. <laughs> I can imagine you doing that, Jay. Of course I would. It's what, it, yeah. it's, it's it's what I do. It's what I want, of course. It's what I do. Um, and, you know, and I think that sort of thing, you know, there's a lot of very successful parenting podcasts and they, yeah. uh, I think they have been really helpful to new parents I've listened. In fact... Did I've you got, listen I've, to Josh's and, yeah, and I've, Rob's? I've got a quite specific beef, but just to step off the parenting train for a second. Yeah. So you've had Josh on this podcast a while ago, yeah. mm. and you've you've really thrown me under the bus, okay? So when I was last on the podcast, I guess I'm, I didn't remember saying this, and in many ways, I'm honoured that you remembered, and it's a credit to you as a, as a podcaster and as a friend and as a historian. I think I said once that I had an inkling that I would love to try stand-up comedy because I was watching Mock the Week once in my student common room <laughs> at boarding school. Yes. And I sort of just had an idea of what one of the punchlines might be. And then that was the punchline <laughs> that the comedian said. <laughs> yes, yes. I think I said it to <laughs> Phil Wang. I think it was Phil Wang. <laughs> How far has this story gone? Because I know what whittacombe has got hold of it because it was punted straight onto our text group and it's been... <laughs> <laughs> really? Was yeah. it? <laughs> so the the, the 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 Lang upgrade, and of course we're all upgrading all the time. 
a lie can travel halfway around the world while the truth is still doing up its laces. But I, I always said to you, I, I came on the podcast and you told me after you went, um, I was sitting in the common room earlier at Eton and uh, I was watching Mot the Week. And before the punchline came out, you said the punchline, you thought, I could be a comedian. Right. But even then, we're watching, what we're watching, we're watching live upgrading. Mm. Because I, yeah, that, that's, that's loosely what I said. And I, and I stand by it. That is what happened. And I volunteered that information on a, uh, on, on a, on a podcast which does solid numbers. Um, I, yeah, but, but I would have, I think, said it under duress, under quite a lot of lang pressure, with a sort of, sort of air of embarrassment, as if, like, I didn't think I was better than the comedians <laughs> on Mock the Week uh, when I was 16. Or indeed now. And it, it, I, it's a show in which I famously struggled. I, oh, wait, hang on. I, have, I, I detailed it yeah. totally <laughs> differently. <laughs> like this. Well, with it, so I've, I've since listened to the podcast, but I was first received news of it when Widdicombe pops up on the text group. And uh, he's obviously it's, it's it's only a text, but you can just tell he's grinning like a Cheshire cat because <laughs> <laughs> he's he's gone on private parts. Um, a, a, a surprising left turn, uh, to be honest. But it's he's he's really struck gold when it comes to <laughs> <laughs> screwing me over. And uh, oh and my god, Jamie and Alex have told him that when I was on the podcast. <laughs> I used to boast about how I knew I could be a comedian because I would watch comedy shows at school and I'd always know the punchlines before it was said them. And always is such a game changer there. <laughs> always is so, it's such a dramatic term, always. So Josh um, is a, a, a very amusing texter who likes to present uh, gossip, usually in the form of a quiz. Mm. So this was his quiz. Just did Jamie Lang's podcast. Uh, sorry, Alex, you've, uh, you've not made it into the question there. Um, and he it's told a, a story about how Ivo knew that he should be a comedian. What was it? A, he once had a dream where Lee Evans told him he should give it a go. B, as a kid, he would watch comedy shows on TV and know all the punchlines before they said them. <laughs> C, he didn't want to be a comic, but everyone at his school kept telling him he had a gift. <laughs> D, he once made a joke in a school assembly that even made the teachers laugh and that he felt he felt like he was coming home. And E, he used to submit jokes for the Now Show from the age of 13 under an assumed name. <laughs> Imagine watching th th that text come in and then watching everyone guess all of the other options yeah. because option B... It's too much. It couldn't, it it could, it's ludicrous. It couldn't possibly be B. <laughs> so people are... People are really enjoying this. Who, who's in the group? Who's in the group? It's not for me to give away everyone in the text group, but I think it was um, I think it was Nish Kumar who came up with the, the nickname uh, Precog, um, which is I don't know if you've seen the film Minority Report. Yeah, yeah. The, <laughs> the Precogs, pre pre <laughs> the characters who lie in the bath, and their, their their main and indeed sole purpose is they're able to tell when murders are going to happen. They're, they're also completely hairless. Aren't completely they? hairless. Yeah, yeah. Don't, don't worry, that Photoshop was knocked out pretty quickly. <laughs> <laughs> of, a, of, a, of a bald Ivo Graham lying in a bath waiting for Andy Parsons to say on the show. The precog. <laughs> like, it's Mono Report is one of my favourite films. Of it's the actually year. great. It's, quite, it's really good. It's so good. I, th I think he's going to become like reality. I think precogs are going to be real. <laughs> oh yeah, no, it it's definitely feels like we're yeah. getting closer to yeah. Minority Report now. And then, yeah. But but they are quite, you know, Samantha Morton absolutely brilliant in the role. But it's not like you're not watching it going like that'd be a fun life, just sort of like <laughs> trembling in horror <laughs> in a bathtub. <laughs> I think that's just general life these days, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, 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 that's Waking that's up in the bath, the, trembling. The, that's where I do my best trembling actually yeah, in, the, yeah. in the bath. Yeah. Obviously, I've got Mot the Week on one screen. I've got eight out of ten cats on another. I'm seeing them all live. Yeah. It's just... <laughs> but literally one. <laughs> I was a cock. <laughs> I'm guessing the punchline. I was... I you was, came in. Oh my god! I just find it so funny. <laughs> I was on Mark the Week uh, again. A, a very fortunate rebooking, given uh, I'd said very little the previous time. But I was on again. <laughs> and again, you know, uh, I'm, I'm confident in my comedic chops, and I'd, I'd prepared, and I said a couple of things, but there were long stretches where I was saying absolutely nothing. <laughs> Do you know what it's like to have? I kept thinking of the precog thing, being like, where are my precog skills now? Yeah, yeah. I'm sat here and it's happening and I literally can contribute and it'll be beneficial to my career. <laughs> Get me in that bath. Yeah, yeah. Shave me. <laughs> Shave. I'm too, I've got too much hair. Shave me, Dara. That's, that's how Dara always knows what to say. Yeah. He's precogged himself for years. Dara is very precoggy. <laughs> That'd be a big bath, actually. <laughs> 
<laughs> Let me get in the bath with you, Dora. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just for the scenes we'd like to see around. <laughs> Bathe together with O'Brien. Nice. So I, you know, listen, it was... <laughs> Great. It was a great Tell day on the Dora, How do you always know? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. It's so funny. Bathing with a promise. <laughs> you understand all the Suddenly you're hosting everything. I'm just imagining it, like the, the tip of his like bald head just emerging over the bubbles. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh my god, that is so good. Do you get nervous on those shows, Ivo? Yeah, I, I think I, I, it's it's very hard because you're sort of um, yeah. I, I think I think panel shows are quite tricky because you you've got to know when to jump in mm. and you've got to. Uh, it's competitive as well, isn't it? How, so how, much, how much is pre? Is it any pre cog? Pre cog for me. Yeah, <laughs> every yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Taking you out of the equation. <laughs> pre cog is so genius. I've seen it like a beach ball. <laughs> um, but I think well, the, the, the topical ones I think are both the, the the easiest to prep for because they're literally about what's been in the news that week, um, and but also the hardest because obviously some of the comics on them do do comedy about the news and also if, even if you do stuff that isn't really about the news sometimes you can find a way to sort of shoehorn it in mm. but broadly i'm not very uh, you know i'm like if, if i'm if i'm at a, you know at the pub i'm not rushing to say something funny about what's happened in politics i tell you yeah. I, don't, I don't tweet a lot of that sort of thing i find it very stressful i find it's very easy to sort of say the wrong thing politically mm. obviously i think we have a you know um uh, enjoyed a, a great deal of sort of privilege, which you've got, you've got to be quite careful to check if ever you're sort of wading in on um, any sort of. That's a battleground, isn't it? Because of the because of the privileged background, because of the sort of schooling and things like that, it's quite hard to 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 have an opinion, isn't it? And I think even if you're trying to distance yourself from it, then you've, you're wary of seeming too much of a. Uh, it might seem sort of quite performative, or that you're like a sort of mm. champagne socialist, or that, or, or, or that it, you know, you say something which is then going to come back to sort of haunt you in sort of five or ten years when you make an incredibly cynical or cold-hearted like business decision, or like you know what I mean? Do, like, do you find that hard now with comedy, right? <clears throat> which is where because you know jokes don't age the same as they used to. Do you now have to almost do you double think what you're saying within jokes because you're like okay, is this going to age well, or do you not have that problem? <laughs> so I just keep thinking he's like I, I know it's going to age well because I can see so far into the future that this is going to be a banger in 50 I just, years yeah. I keep laughing in my own head Dara he... please let me get into the bath with you <laughs> Dara get out of the tub <laughs> Dara, Dara can I just jump in quickly Maybe just even get under the shower head just to see if I'm going to get cancelled for this one in 10 years just, yeah. just, just a quick a quick little dips Please, please, Dara. I'm just I'm imagining Dara is like some oracle you go to to see if you're going to be cancelled in 50 years. Just let me put my head under the shower head. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> it's such a it's good very, image. It's, it's such a brilliant it's, it's image. It's very hard to respond to any of the other sort of uh, more admirably serious questions oh, where we just keep, keep, going, back to the keep going back to that one. But it is true, though. It must that must happen where you know there are so many comedians <laughs> that have said things in the past that haven't aged well. So it, and and comedy now is like a minefield in some cases because there, there are so many things that people have different opinions and stuff like that. And comedy, in my take of it, where people we, you would take situations, political situations, the news, whatever it was, um, and you would twist it to give a punchline that was um, surprising. Mm. And that's what makes it funny, right? It's a, but now that's hard sometimes because people don't take it as a joke and that's tricky in comedy. What do you think? Um, I think that, I think you do, you do, you do have to be careful, uh, but I think that's good. I think it's good. Um, I think, you know, doesn't... That's oh, not a bad thing. I don't think it's a bad thing to, to have to have a certain degree of self-awareness and, um, uh, you know, respect and care. I think it's hard when you're, you know, in a slightly more like live scenario. You know, if you're if you're if you're if you're sort of in some sort of free flowing chat on a, on a sort of panel show or if you're even, even at a live gig where so many of them are sort of recorded or people will report back from things they've said at gigs, you, you can get carried away in the moment. And um and obviously you don't want to be checking yourself to such an extent that you never say anything remotely sort of, you know, in instinctive. Mm. And you have to trust that audiences will sort of judge everything on a contextual basis. But I, I just think there's a danger with, you know, I think there is more scrutiny and I think there, there are more consequences now in the sort of comedy world. But I, I think it's a very slippery slope when comedians start talking about how 
oh, it's it's you know it's changing comedy or even it's ruining in comedy because that's I, wrong. I just, I just don't, I just you don't, don't think, think it's it true. And I think really, you know, I think skilled <laughs> operators um, uh, can still kind of say whatever they want and um, and and and. And, and and get away with it uh, because they're understood by their audience or in some cases because if, if they're already very successful they're protected by the platforms they're on almost not as many people get cancelled as I think, no they don't you know, so, but yeah. also I, you're because you're I, I you're like me we're all of us we're sort of quite people pleasers so we don't want to actually mm. upset anyone there are co comedians who like their comedy is well, it's, um, it's the joke at someone else's expense isn't well, it? there's comedy can, right can be, they, it can be slightly lazier I feel this is the, it's, this it's, is the it's, thing, easy, right? it's like sort of bullying at school. It's quite easy to like target someone or something. And who are you talking about, man? You. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's my jam. Do you, <laughs> do you think Jamie's is, a, is, a, is, is punching downwards? <laughs> She's right on this podcast. Yeah. Yeah. you think I'm punching you, downwards? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You put on a good sort of veneer. <laughs> then I'm but down. secretly, you're who up. am I punching the, down the, to? The, the you can't poor. Get... The problem is, like, the you're, poor. You're, yeah, you hate poor people. <laughs> God, what a hell of an accusation! <laughs> I know. Can't just say that. I know it's <laughs> the truth hurts. <laughs> even Stephen Spencer wouldn't say that. <laughs> it's not the BBC. We can say it. But, want, but, but I mean, there are there are comedians who who do punch down, um, and that's their comedy. Uh, it, it, I mean, I know you're going to be careful about what you say because you know whatever. But um, what do you think? Do you think that's? Do you think it's funny for people to do that, or are there, there's a certain audience that like that, right? Um, I do, I don't think that um, it's uh, there's an audience who like that, but I don't, I don't think that's great, really. I think it's fun to try and work out how you can say controversial things, but uh, under sort of an umbrella of. Uh, you know, decency and I suppose more cynically, like yeah. likability. Like I, I've definitely found that when I started, I was very much like, how can I be uh, most likable? Um, you know, I've come, from, I've gone to Eton, I've gone to Oxford, even if not, I'm not mentioning these things on stage. It's quite evident from, you know, I'm a sort of very posh 19 year old. Mm. Um, I've obviously got all of Mock the Week just locked away in my head. <laughs> <laughs> I've got the confidence of somebody who's been quoting Mock the Week. <laughs> you know how annoying that was for everyone else in the common room. Um, but it's like, so, so try and work on ways which, you know, you can sort of tell self deprecating stories, which were not, not hard to come by because as a teenager, you've got loads of self deprecating stories. Mm. And, um, and then, and actually, as an adult, you sort of, um, uh, you've been going a few years, you're a bit more confident on stage, you want to excite yourself a bit more by, by pushing your own boundaries, even a tiny bit. And also, you know that some of the stuff doesn't work so well, like, you know, I, I, sometimes I'll dip into quite old material, usually the thing is you do a new show at Edinburgh every year, mm. and that's got to be new. But when you're doing gigs around about the place, particularly slightly tougher gigs, like, a you know, a rowdy gig on a Friday night, or a sort of, you know, possibly like a corporate gig, you dip into older, more tried and tested material, or you go to your like, Oh, you what, go to your, your you Swiss imagine, Army knife that you your know. Swiss Army knife of like, and that's usually still like the stuff that you used to introduce people the first time, wow. like um, when you were just really honing your first ever 10 minutes or 20 minutes. So for me, that stuff about like, you know, sort of losing my virginity and being like awkward about that. About that I've, I've caught myself at a couple of gigs recently being like, I'm, I'm a sort of, you know, I'm a, I'm a graying, you know, bearded 32 year old man. It's like people aren't really leaning in to quite the same way to sort of what a cute, awkward, like, <laughs> you know, uh, little waif and stray you were when you were popping your chair at the age of 21. Um, I just like, that's not, and I, I did it at a, I did it not, not the one on Zoom, thankfully, but I did it at a Freshers gig. What, you popped like, your cherry? No, sorry. <laughs> at Freshers gig. At a Freshers gig. I'm a loss of junior at 21. Um, uh, at, at the end of my own time at university, although I think if it had happened at the Freshers gig, that probably would have, we don't need to get into the specifics of it now. I'm sure you boys have got stats of your own to bring to the table, but it's very much off camera biz. Um, I uh, am half your age by seven. Um, but with the added dynamic of a Freshers gig, you don't stay behind after the Freshers gigs. You log off and let them finish their risottos in peace. So, <laughs> but but I was doing material at Freshers Gig, and then I did stuff about losing my virginity. And again, I was like, I'm ten years older than like a lot of these, a lot of these uh, teenagers like won't even have any romantic experience yet. And so me trying to make out that I am one of them, like, the, but even worse, like look at me, what a loser I was when I was like losing my virginity when I was 21. And you're looking at people and like. Well, we're 18. We haven't lost a bit of We don't care about this. And like, wow. So you have to have that in your head as well. At some times, where you think, think about bit, relating to the audience. But then equally, you probably don't want to do. Like, I don't. I, I, I do stand up now. I've, a lot of my latest shows about becoming a father. But I don't do a lot of that at some gigs because 
if it, if it's if it's a sort of student crowd or a younger crowd, you've got to hit that quite hard. Otherwise, mm. you, and it's partly it's your own vanity and wanting to still feel young and relevant. You're like, as soon as you do that, pe- people are just like, oh, he's a completely different generation, and I think can switch off a bit more. So you're just trying to pitch. You 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 know that's that's something I obsess about. I would say as much as. Um, Oh, but to, to that's go, in, wait, that's you, interesting you, though. That's you, interesting. Do you dress differently according to uh, audience? Um, I, uh, if it's a young crowd, what you? I wear reckon Ivo has a, in his wardrobe. He has about four items of clothing that he recycles. <laughs> four, It'll be like four two, items of clothing in stacks <laughs> of old magazines. That's about yeah. it. Dark blue, light blue, <laughs> heat and blue. <laughs> Box of blue. <laughs> you don't need you don't need many clothes when you spend all your life in the bar. It's, it's just a load of weird wetsuits in there, sort of like skin coloured wetsuits. Yeah. I've got four shirts and a hundred towels. <laughs> Most of them are on the floor. When me and Dara are in there together, it is yeah, it's, all yeah, over it's, the place. it's for safety. So I think I don't think I, I don't think I I, I I think that's maybe a little bit too calculated. But I but certainly the calculation of thinking about material. Um, do you, I mean, do you have a fear of not being relevant anymore? No, is that what comedians no, have? I think or you no? just sort of it's quite exciting to you know feel you sort of grow up and become you you know you talk about different things and some of your audience moves with you and also if. There's no excuse for not like being able to put yourself in lots of different places now. I think mm. I'm very aware that um, you know I've, I've I do some stuff on Radio Four, mm. uh, and you know certainly some of my material and general outlook is of a slightly more sort of fogeyish persona, which I'm kind of growing into. So I think I suit that sort of audience quite well, and I get particularly the Edinburgh Fringe. You know, a, a lot of sort of essentially people who either are or could be my parents' friends. They usually still are. Mum and dad really <laughs> work the phone book in July. The boy's going up to Edinburgh again. But, you know, I've done a lot of football podcasts, so even though it's yeah, probably yeah. at the sort of more non laddy end of the football did you, spectrum, did you just go, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was a huge football fan. Have you ever see his? Really what, some of his favorite things you do on Instagram is when you go into a tour of the stadiums. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I that, love oh, that. Thanks, Jamie. And and what's so annoying about that? <laughs> Not like, is that you only do it occasionally. They're, they're very, very stressful to do, actually. Oh, they're so I'm, I'm good. Not a, I'm not a natural vlogger, Jamie. It's actually very <laughs> stressful walking around Craven Cottage on an afternoon shouting puns about Fulham into the into the breeze. <laughs> and also, I can just imagine how much you hate it when you have to redo it. Oh, so <laughs> many. And, like, and, and, you know, I'm very obsessive about the specific wording of the bits. And so I do try to get it right in a single take. And that usually takes a few run-ups just because I trip over my own words. And then I remember once I was running it really tight to get a train. I was like, I've got to get it right this time. And I just finished, just had to finish take someone was walking past and went twat <laughs> <laughs> you gotta leave that in surely I can't leave, I can't leave it in no no you can't there's a certain context in which people would enjoy that far more than all of the rest of the pre-prepared content <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's sack off everything else and just leave that in <laughs> the final joke um, but I think in terms of like having a you know you work out more interesting ways to criticise yourself and also you work out sort of fun targets like I think just picking on you know any you know punching down towards sort of um sort of, you know, uh, any obvious or sort of defenseless groups is, is, I think, very rarely a very classy thing to do. But if you can you find need to be nasty observations... to be funny, I guess. I had a bit in my show this year, which is very much based on the fact that I spend a lot of my Friday and Saturday nights driving around the country uh, <laughs> doing gigs, about how I listen to Radio 1 on Friday nights uh, in my car and how... Um, uh, I, I think people who uh, text into Radio One saying that all the tunes are making them wish they were going out are a pathetic community of people, <laughs> and I really enjoyed saying that every night because it was really fun describing a group of people as a pathetic community of people. But I also think that th- that's not really doing any harm to any particularly vulnerable people in society. And also, you know, if you do text into Radio One to compliment the tunes, absolutely fine. Really, yeah, but, no but that's you hit the nail on the head. I saw this really. This was genius. Um, you're probably a friend of yours who went on NFL UK. Oh yeah, Finn Taylor's uh, bit about Finn American. Oh, I saw that. Yeah, it, that did good. you see this? Yeah, it was great. When he d- he described all UK NFL fans as just complete freaks. Yeah, yeah. Because it's like people in New yeah. York waking up at three AM to watch county cricket. <laughs> so good. In their parents' basements, freaking <laughs> monster. Don't have a credit rating. Was he, so good. he was asked what a fumble or something was. He said, "Is it where you murder your wife?" <laughs> <laughs> just a little fumble. <laughs> he, he described that on live TV and all the American how, guys how couldn't he, understand what was going on. How did he get that gig? It seemed like... I, oh, it's it, such a funny... That's such a great... This It's such a great 
booking, I would mm, say. Yeah. It's an amazing booking because think how many people saw that who aren't NFL fans who then go and go, oh, it's interesting to watch NFL. I like that. I think you, I think in that sort of situation, you can have your cake and eat it a bit. I mean, I'm sure some NFL fans were offended by it and I'm sure some of the NFL broadcasters were like, why is this guy insulting our thing? But <laughs> yeah. actually it pulls more, as you say, mm. I, I, obviously I'm not, I'm, I'm not an NFL fan. I don't mean obviously I'm not, I mean, <laughs> uh, I am not an NFL fan. So obviously I wasn't like digging deep into the coverage that weekend, but if it hadn't been for that fin clip, I wouldn't have known that it was happening in London that weekend. I know, there and you it, go. So it does, you know, I think those sorts of, it's hard. To, you don't want to engineer them too much, but miss bookings or little blunders like that. That's 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 that's. And mm. Finn is really good at that. He's so. Good. I, I got. You know, Quint. I said this before. I actually said this, Jamie Dimitri. Quentin Tarantino talks of like with his movies, right? He goes ten movies, and then you're kind of done. It's like a about boxing match, and a lot of comedians talk about the fact that they say, you know, people try and do comedy forever but there is certain communities who go comedy you can only do for a bit because you almost then run out of material do you think there's something in that or is that not fair i think your life has to uh be pretty dull to run out of material right well i don't i i i certain lots of comics uh get, get less interesting of course i think like anything there is a sort of freshness to also as consumers we like new stuff mm. it's for you know i was reading like frank skinner is, is one of the comics who's i think you know the biggest legends in the UK and who are as aged with the most uh, sort of gr like grace and he's, you know, still hosted TV shows well into his like, you mm. know, uh, whatever, like 40s and 50s and and, and done really big stand-up shows. But I was reading his, he's got an amazing book about being a stand-up and he's talking about how even though he's been very lucky and he's financially comfortable, he's reflecting a lot on the fact that, you know, he's just got to accept that uh, broadcasters aren't as interested in making a show with him in the noughties as they are in the 90s. So I think your first challenge is accepting that inevitably certain things just aren't going to be happening like they were like most people peak a little bit earlier that's hard and 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 you have to be able to take that with grace and dignity and not become bitter or start ranting on social media about about sort of um you know gatekeepers or whatever and i also think that creatively you have to find a way to keep you know keep finding new things to mm. to to talk about it that's is hard. hard though it's <clears throat> i i i've it's hard right because I was talking with this with you, mate. We're competitive. Like as a human, you know, at school, we I remember at school, we would have our exam results and they would be graded like first to last, right? Mm. Ever since we're kids, we're always like graded on what you're doing. So everything is a competition. Does it, if you're in the first team, your name was on the board or whatever it was. So innately within us, we had this sort of competitive side, which is dangerous, right? Because at some point you cannot keep winning. Mm. And so if your life is all about winning and that's also not kind of fulfilling in lots of ways. And I find comedy... I would find comedy really hard, personally, because there are so many comedians out there, so many brilliant comedians, and you're all friends, and but you're all touring, you're all trying to get each other's tickets because they want to come to your show. You're all doing jokes which maybe have similar things that you then have to change because, oh, he did a joke about that. It, it's a hard industry to be in and also be um, supportive at the same time. Is that fair? Yeah, I th I, well, I think it is a very supportive industry. It I, is. I think it's really fun. I, I've not, I've, 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 you know, I've been doing it for ten years since uni, and I've loved it. I don't think that. I mean, I've been lucky that you know I've been relatively busy through most of that time, and there's always been a sort of general sense that even if quite slowly at times, I am sort of improving and making progress. I think it's quite a bad. I think it's quite a. Um, a uh, sort of dangerous thing to constantly be doing to your brain to be, you know, trying content, to think of content, 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 content. I, and mm. I think that's a sort of bigger, you know, it's very much, you know, you guys know it probably more than I do. You're doing, you're doing podcasts, you know, you, Jamie, uh, do, you, do you do other podcasts? Or other I mean, no. you're doing your, you're doing your, you know, your wedding on, on, but it's on a easier podcast. though, because I can just, it's talking between, yeah, you have to be entertaining and fun, but when you go to a dinner party, you're not going to sit there and be boring. You have to be entertaining and fun. So it's, I treat it like a dinner party. It's true. We but then some people who podcast their whole lives become sort of, uh, you know, like I remember seeing one comic, she, she said that she went to a dinner party and her friend said that she couldn't, uh, I think it was Joanne McNally who does, who does uh, mm. the podcast with, with Vogue, Prince's wife. Yeah. Um, but with Vogue, the, the, my the therapist ghosted me. So good. And so, so funny. Successful. But she's, Joanne said that, that she, uh, they, they basically made her sign a sort of equivalent of an NDA before the dinner party because you're just so used to like everything becoming content. Oh, I think it's shit, changing yeah. your brain. Uh, it's like, it's like, you know, this is the most boring point in the world, but like, ooh, we, we're yet to see, I think the real long-term consequences of the fact that like our relationship with our attention spans mm. and our phones and our desire to, to be doing something all of the time have changed so much in the last 10 years. Yes. And I think of comedy uh, uh, like I've, being comedy and being in the public facing domain and um, 
you know, I think what are my aims for the next essentially 30 years? They're to um, have fun, to be able to, you know, keep the show on the road for me and my family and to, to have dignity and not go completely mad. That, mm. That's a, a like, and if, you, if you're going to achieve all of that, then that, it's okay. Then it's okay, I think. Does that make sense? That makes more sense than anything. It's quite I mean, fun to go a little bit mad. A li- uh, well, slightly uh, insane. And, and and now increasingly that's sort of permissible because the, because people document their... I mean, you guys were you doing... You document it, your madness. Yeah, people would like document but, it. But your lives were, you know, I, I actually think the, you know, as, a, as someone who was an, an avid consumer of MIC circa <laughs> 2015, uh, you know, real bad boys o'clock, <laughs> there, there's actually... Um, the, the sort of soap opera and occasionally quite like villainous quality of the show is mm. something that you guys have, have sort of ridden out. Like, like you, you had a certain kind of PR training from so early on yeah. um, about how to sort of spin your, your realities into, into content and just about keep a grip on likability. That um, was hard though. In terms of like losing yourself when you do a reality show, oh my God, you think like that is... You, I, I lost the distinction between reality and and non-reality. I, I couldn't. I, I, every single time I went into a conversation, I thought I was in a scene. I lost that sense of reality, which was really you lose your sense of self. And mm. I agree with you that I like when you're comedian. Being a, a, a comedian is tricky. Content, content, content. Oh, that's funny. Okay, that's funny. Oh, I saw that. Then and you're reflective. Phil Wang always said the re- comedians are reflective people. They think, oh, isn't that funny how people do that? And I could write that in a funny sort of way. And so yeah, you're constantly looking at stuff. So then my question is: is when do you switch off? Or um, do you not? Or is it just a subconscious thing that you suddenly go, oh, yeah. I was going to try and pull the conversation <laughs> strands together and give the um, aggressively wholesome answer of when I'm when I'm parenting. But the problem is, it's not even that, really. Yeah. You know, you sort of, um, I mean, I'm not a big, I don't, you know, I, I don't talk about parenting a huge amount on no, uh, right. stage or on podcasts, and I don't put that much on social media. But you're still thinking about stuff. You know, mm. I'm thinking now that my, my daughter is now getting to the age where she's, she's, she's talking loads. She's... Uh, She's saying unbelievably sort of sweet things all the time and got these funny little turns of phrase, uh, like all three-year-olds, and suddenly remember that when, whenever I was reading about sort of parent, like about adults doing comedy, which is what I considered when I was 21, I didn't think like, I'm an adult doing comedy. I thought I'm a student doing comedy, and if I'm lucky, I'll get to be an adult doing comedy. Mm. And you'd read, you know, books by people like Stuart Lee, and they talk with such uh, sort of dismissal about kids say the funniest thing comedy. And, so, and I've, so I've thought long before I was a parent, I'm like, well, that's the thing you, you can't do. And actually, if you become a parent and your life becomes more domestic and it starts to eat up a lot more of your time, then that becomes such a focal point. And that's why Josh and Rob have obviously pulled off this lockdown masterstroke of mm. turning their lives into a parenting sitcom. And But I don't think that was something that either of them probably anticipated doing before they became parents or even before the mm. lockdown. It's just something that people people do want as much stuff as possible. But it's funny and interesting as well, because then you have really... Who, who, were your, who were your idols growing up? I, I, um, uh, I mean, <laughs> Nish Kumar. <laughs> Nish was your idol. <laughs> Nish Kumar, Dora Breen, yeah. Hugh Dennis, <laughs> Russell <laughs> Howard, Frankie <laughs> Boyle. <laughs> Joel Dommett. I, 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 I knew what I was going to say, and I, I always loved it. <laughs> who were your idol? Who did you love? Who, who, when, you, when you were younger and you used to see them, who were the ones that you... I really, I loved the Mighty Boosh. Um, yeah. uh, that, was, that was my that was the first one. You loved really them, didn't you? I, yeah, re-wa- um, rewatch it regularly. Oh, really? Yeah, what's, yeah, your, what's your favourite Mighty Boosh episode? I never got into that, that is, it. It's a bit sort of it, like, I don't think it's all age fantastic. And the problem with surreal stuff is you've got to be slightly in the mood for it. Yeah. And some of it hits more harder. Than I mean, there's, there's the classic old Greg, obviously. There's Melky Joe. That's great. But I, a one I thought I, I, hadn't, I hadn't seen, I discovered recently, was, which is The Party. Oh, that's a, that's a it's fantastic episode. It's fucking amazing. What, uh, what, 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 I have never seen this. You need to watch. Describe what The Mighty Boosh is, though. Like, the, the Mighty Boosh it, was Noel Fielding and Julian Barrett's uh, show about um, a couple of essentially, um, it was a sort of surreal show about a couple of Camden hipsters. Okay, yeah, <laughs> or, or t- uh, attempting to be Camden hipsters. Howard Moon was very not hip. Yeah. So, so, and so, uh, Noel Fielding, uh, who plays Vince, is very, very cool in it. Or 
and and actually cool. He thinks he's cool. No, he is yeah. like he's sort of cool in it. And yeah. there was and actually there were but you know in a sort of um, I mean there was this period in the mid noughties uh, when I was reading every single word of the enemy and just taking it all <laughs> absolutely as face value, <laughs> the Old Testament, um, <laughs> where they were like on the cover and Noel Fielding was like obviously cool, but then Julian Barrett the joke was that he actually wasn't cool, but he was cool. As well, he was actually. cool. Yeah, yeah. And I think um, they are so. Um, uh, I, I, I went to see them with my dad. It's a very cool thing to do. <laughs> I, 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 that there's this amazing scene in the party episode where um, they're DJing, and it's uh, and, and they all play. They play lots of characters. And Richard Iowati, who's one of my common mm, heroes as well, amazing. he mm. plays this shaman called Sabu, who's yeah. DJing this party alongside this <laughs> Noel Fielder character called Tony Harrison, who's just a sort of He's a, just ball, a, head, a, yeah. a pink little a sort of head, like a cleft um, in a box. <laughs> and they're discussing what to, they, they sort of <laughs> discuss about the DJ and Tony Harrison insisting that they play uh, Fleetwood Mac's Tusk in its entirety. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> do, and do you know what he says? Oh, you, are, you are a ball. I could get away with maybe one track off Rumours, Max. And it's like, it's just, it's a classic you had to be there. But my brother and I, any situation at party, it's we're talking about playing Fleetwood Mac's oh, Tusk my. in its entirety <laughs> oh, with the pauses as Lindsay Buckingham intended. As intended, yes. Yeah, it's so it's one of those, like, it's, 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 it was such a formative show. And I actually think it's, it's not, you know, it, it's maybe not aged as well as some things, but there also hasn't aged as awkwardly as some other no, things either. I've... It exists in its own universe. And I think they're both, you know, national treasures still in their own yeah. ways. Obviously, Noel Fielding's doing, doing Bake Off. Julian Barrett, I've this weird thing over the summer where he um, he's in this ad. For, I don't know if you guys he's, have Whenever I see him in anything else, I cannot you not see him as Howard uh, Moon. Moon. Because he's just perfect, like gravelly, sarcastic. He does a, there's a gin brand called Sipsmith. Yeah. And uh, and they, they've got this character called Mr. Swan, who's the, the sort of the, the, the icon of Sipsmith. And it, there's a really funny advert for Sipsmith voiced by Julian Barrett as the swan. And then they had some adverts for... <laughs> For Wimbledon, <laughs> where Sipsmith was the official uh, gin of Wimbledon, but obviously the ad was Julian Barrett saying that Wimbledon was the official tennis of Sipsmith gin. <laughs> Lovely switcheroo. You should get oh a bit of that into, into your great yeah, stuff. Yeah. They switched it round. Mm. <laughs> I took it. I don't. Uh, I'm not. No, I'm go not on, Sam. Sure. I um uh, this summer uh, for a couple of weeks. Um, I don't do a lot of comedy writing gigs, but um, I was intrigued to try when it came through um, a job. Uh, contributing some tweets for the Twitter account of Smith Smith, Smith Gin <laughs> during, <laughs> during Wimbledon. <laughs> As in the character of Mr. Swan, which as a Mighty Boosh fan was a very weird experience. Being like, obviously, Julian Barrett is not actually going to have to go into the booth and say these things. But I'm picturing him as Mr. Swan because he is Mr. Swan. <laughs> you know, and obviously it's a, it's a, it's a delicate and... Give me you know, some tweets. What, what did you... Oh. Well, it was... I thought, well, I'm going to... I'll probably be watching Wimbledon anyway, sort of, you know, procrastinating right at my Edinburgh show. So it's sort of the fun work it, where I'll be doing what I was already doing, which was like providing a live commentary on the tennis on social media. But... Actually, you love watching sport and writing cricket or tennis or whatever. That's, that's exactly your it. thing. Maybe yeah. I could go and sort of walk around Wimbledon and have someone shout twat at me. <laughs> <laughs> Do that there. <laughs> but I um, the pro they then said at the start of the tournament, they said actually one of the directives from the like, BBC or whatever is that you can't um, you can't offer commentary on matches and you can't uh, mention any players by name. So actually, that was quite quite a limiting. That is quite limiting. To it. So like, can you read about the tennis, but not referencing any of the matches or any of the players? So Mr. Swan was doing some pretty hard yards <laughs> about like strawberries and cream culture, <laughs> and like what exactly a tie break is. <laughs> I like just. I mean, it's a real shame because the ads was are so good, and I think have won awards and stuff. And I think wow. you know some company social media it does is so like goes viral, and it, will it add is to the it's brand. so important. You know, yeah. I'm aware this is not sort of you know the, the height of uh, you know of of of, an, uh, of artistic destiny, but I thought like it'd be fun to see if I could do that, particularly given I'm not very good on social media myself. These tweets were not getting traction. <laughs> I was just. Like, Oh, no. Mr. Swan was dying on his ass. That's when you're phoning up, you're dropping a message in that group. Guys, you wouldn't mind um, Mr. Swan just retweeting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Swan's dying out here. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Yeah. Swan yeah. tweeting about how he's going to need some yeah. extra like, sort of gin get, spritz in the heat wave. Get arrested for, for, like. for killing the swan by, by the Queen's guard. Oh my also, God. I forgot, was one point, I was I've, I've never managed two Twitter accounts on one phone before. I was toggling, toggling between that and my personal account. <laughs> one awful day where I forgot to change accounts. <laughs> so I tweeted Mr. Swan from my own account. <laughs> <laughs> That in itself should have been the, yeah, that probably would have been more viral. <laughs> I managed to get it down. Someone texted me like, 
have you just tweeted? <laughs> <laughs> just, in, just random. I don't do much on social media under my own name, just in the middle of one day being like, the mixed double start to the game. Who, Mrs. Swan's ready for a busy game. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, genius. I, I do want to ask one more thing is that, you know, there's all this thing about comedy. It takes 10 years in order to really know your craft and all that different thing and sort of get in the industry. To young comics who are out there, what would you say to them in order to go, okay, listen, this is, social media's changed, comedy's changed, lots of different changes. What would you give, what advice do you give to young comics if they ask? Um, I, it's, it's, it's very hard because I do feel... Um, like I got, a, I got a lot of great opportunities. I started in my first year at uni. And so I got to do loads and loads of gigs in student bars, mm. basically to my friends. So you, you've got a supportive crowd. You've got a decent sized crowd, like 30, 40 people. And also you've got a real back, like sort of log of stuff you can tap into. And, and there's no shame in like being a coward when you're starting out and trying to do jokes about you know, sort of like, you know, student parties or campus in jokes when you're just trying to work out what it is to be on stage. Mm. I think if I'd started in, you know, every year it becomes more crowded. And if you, mm. particularly you hear about the London open mic scene, you're doing these gigs above pubs to like 10 people and they're all the other acts. So everyone's just looking at their own notes or very sort of stressed. Wow, and, and that's so intense. I think it's great if you can start in a place where you've got the opportunity to just like get some stage time and, and you know... Um, and have an audience. And, and have an audience. And that is harder. That being said, even that feels like sort of an outdated regret now because now online you can just build anything. And I don't, I mean, I've, 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 I'm not even outside of Mr. Swan. I've, I've not been a fantastic content creator in my life. Um, but I do think that being able to uh, just tr try stuff online and get an instant response for it is, is probably so much easier then you know traipsing across the country for five minutes to sort of you know in, a, in quite a grubby gig yeah but you have to you have to be you have to let all of your kind of um embarrassment and all the different things go because when you're putting it out online it's it's, 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 it's revealing it's, right yeah, yeah it's it, the internet is written in ink you know you, yeah. don't, you don't get that sense of well like i didn't tell my friends about my first few gigs i was like i, I didn't even think i was going to do stand up for any length of time i thought it would just be something i wanted to tick off um but i do think i think i think not um uh not getting overly stressed about something being obvious, maybe. I think that's it. And I think with the internet and that, that speeds up. If you're, if you're online, if you particularly something like on social media, or like something like Twitter, which I think is very, it's very fun, but it's so full of like cynicism and mm. anger and, and mm. impatience, you get such a quick sense of things being new going to being like old and like uncool. That, that you could barely get your... It's it's like when people do topical shows, like Month of the Week or whatever, they say, don't go on Twitter for the couple of days beforehand because inevitably you'll feel like every single joke about every news story could possibly have been done. Mm. You've just got to like try and, like an like old person, you know, read the newspaper and, and see what would, comes up in your own head. And you say it, you know, and you say it on the show and it'll, you'll probably say it in a f fresh way. And if it's similar to something that's written online, that's a coincidence, but you'll have done it in an authentic way. Does that make sense? Makes mm. total sense. So I think that's great advice, but that's really, honestly, that's, that's perfect advice. I found, and I think there are, there are comedians when I started, like I've mentioned him already, Stuart Lee was such a big influence and he's someone who's, he's, it's like, he's amazing, but a lot of his stuff is sort of, you know, uh, essentially um, having a go at other comedians or sort of tr like trends mm. in comedy. So if you were a fan of him and then you tried stand up, you would, you'd be sort of, imagining that he was there on your shoulder being like that's obvious that's hack mm. where it's actually and, and i've got friends who started out and it was like they were trying to get to level two before they'd done level one yeah look, which don't, is not, don't run before you can walk yeah, it's like, totally no shame in working out a quite basic like starter pack and then once you're confident in that once you like being on stage then you can you can evolve so quickly yeah so many people say that they they become a character even before they know what they're doing mm. they feel like they have to do something that is that is super neat i vote um i i realize we, you we take up a lot of your time and even though you turned up late when you said you were going <laughs> to be 15 minutes early um we're coming to the end uh, your tour my future my clutter mm. um we, we can get tickets where um, I've, I've got a website, ivogram.com. You've got a website. I've got, so you can say I've got some in my pocket. <laughs> I've got some in my pocket. Uh, they're the only ones that are left. <laughs> We're going to leave the link below as well. So if you want to go and get That's tickets. Nice. I, I, I'm going to say that you're a friend of mine, but honestly, I, I said it before you came, I, I think you're you're truly one of the funniest UK comics. And my my brother who went to you, and the reason why I wanted to get you back on is my brother was, I went for dinner with him. He was saying just, he went and saw you. It's amazing. Go and watch you well, live. It's you. amazing. And follow also, your social media as well. I can't wait to hear which bit of today's podcast is, is spun <laughs> Wildly out of I control with comic. I can't wait. I can't wait. I love the idea of punted into the comic group. <laughs>
<laughs> Ivo, thank you so much Thanks, once Alex. again for being thank like you. Private Parts. Thank we you. really appreciate it, buddy. Everybody, we'll see you next week. Goodbye! Ivo, that is...